Welcome to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we equipped you to more effectively lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. Each week, we help you sharpen your leadership acumen by cracking open the playbooks of dynamic leaders who are doing big things in their professional endeavors. And now your host, leadership tactics and organizational development expert, Karen Farrell-Rhodes. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and welcome to today's episode. Now, for my founders and entrepreneurial CEOs out there, you intimately know how challenging it is to lead your business. There's never enough hours in the day, and you're dealing with everything from high stakes clients to managing people issues, you know, to fixing the office printer. Everything is on your shoulders to tackle. But to help uh, give us some insights today, we have Tom Sharp, who is a renowned leadership expert for entrepreneurs and is the founder and CEO of Build Cool Things. Tom coaches entrepreneurs on how to better lead themselves, as well as showing up as a better leader in their business. Now, be sure to stay tuned for just two minutes after this episode to listen to my closing segment called Karen's Take, where I share a tip on how to use insights from today's episode to further sharpen your leadership acumen. And now, enjoy the show. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and thanks again for joining another episode of the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast. So for my entrepreneur leaders out there, boy, do we have a treat for you. Uh, I am so happy to have with us an expert on leadership for entrepreneurs, and he talks about all aspects of being a great leader of your business and um, please so bring to the mic Mr. Tom Sharp who is the founder and CEO of a company called Build Cool Things and he's going to share a lot of insights with us today on how to be a stronger leader especially if you're an entrepreneur. So welcome to the podcast Tom. Thanks Karen. Thanks for having me and I'm so looking forward to our conversation already. Oh, we're so looking forward to ha- hearing some of the great insights that you have. Thanks. But to get us started, um, Tom, for, you know, as, f- as much as you feel comfortable, would you mind sharing a bit about your personal background so we sure. can get some insights of the superstar behind this person, this guest on our episode today? Sure. I'm a pretty gay- crazy guy. I'm pretty tall as well. I'm 6'6", six, uh, six, and uh, everybody always asks me if I play basketball, and then I have to answer <laughs> that I play chess. But I'm, I don't know, uh, for people who know the Colby system by Kathy Colby, I'm a 10 quick start, which means that I'm like always pioneering, always interested in new things, don't have any stamina to finish like the boring drudgery work i just want to run to a new project and another one and another one and have all these great ideas at least my own brain tells me that they are great and so i struggled to through school i really struggled through school and through university and then i founded my first company where we try to sold uh, sell computers that's like the uh, we're talking Europe, we're talking uh, the first IBM clones type of computers like a long time ago. Uh-huh. I was into software building. I really enjoyed developing software. And uh, this business went nowhere, like absolutely nowhere. I did it oh, together no. with a friend and I learned it and made no money at all. And we didn't lose a lot of money. Let's, that, that's the upside probably. Well, that's- good that's good right that's rare for entrepreneurs that's <laughs> not true. to lose a little bit that's true <laughs> so, but i learned a lot about from that whole experience and then later i started another company and another and another one and uh, so that's where we end up now wow and if um, our listeners listen closely they might catch a slight accent um, can you share with us uh where you were originally grew up or were settled and, and where you are now. Yeah, I'm in Costa Rica now, living in Costa Rica, traveling through the Americas. I love America. I've been to the States so many times and um, 
but I grew up in a very tiny village somewhere to the east of New York, like at the other side of the ocean. And so English, English is not my native language, but I find that most people around the world can understand my English better than they can understand my Dutch. And so... <laughs> Well, I understand you well, so I think our listeners will as well. <laughs> you speak English very well. Thank you. And so for me, it's a, an interesting time because at home I have this reputation of being a leadership author. I wrote a bestseller on delegating, um, being a coach, a high-end coach for entrepreneurs. And I've learned so much from all my um, uh, worldwide, but especially from my Northern Euro American friends, like Perry, guys like Perry Marshall, Dan Sullivan. I cannot even name all of them. There's like a whole <laughs> list of people that I learned a ton from. And, oh, um, but now I'm trying to figure out how can I share my ideas, my insights, my tips, tricks, and tools and suggestions with a global audience. And, uh, so, so that's what I'm doing right now. Oh, that is amazing. Well, we thank you so much for, you know, the gift of your time on our podcast. Absolutely. Because um, you're right in our target market. Um, so let's pull back the layer of the onion a little bit, because having read a lot about you, I know you have a lot of information to offer to individuals. And you say you're a leadership expert for entrepreneurs, but almost all leaders can uh, leverage some of the tips that you uh, yes. give. And that's what this show is all about, is giving um, actionable tools and insights to uh, about leadership to our audience. So the first thing I've got to ask you is to share all your concept about binary messages because yes. I need to learn from that personally. So <laughs> can you start there for us? So for me, the, the story is that I was sitting in my office looking at my computer screen at my Outlook and I was so frustrated. I, I don't know if I was angry, but I was frustrated and maybe even a little in despair because I spent so much time on handling my email, which is weird because I was the resident GTD expert, getting things done expert, a great methodology by David Allen that I still use. I wrote the book on how to process your email in half the time. Wow. Um, I implemented my own advice or how you can say that, like I drank my own champagne <laughs> and, and still I was frustrated with how many emails I had to, to process. So I figured out that every day I received be, uh, like around 150 emails, 150, from my own team members. And I love helping people. And I feel that if they send me this email like, hey, Tom, we have this problem. What, uh, what, how should I fix it? I have all this advice and I have all this experience and I love sharing it and I love helping people. So I was typing paragraph, another paragraph, another paragraph to, to explain my thinking and help my team members. While, of course, in hindsight, I was just frustrating their growth. But I realized, like, I, I cannot do this typing anymore. So I sent mm -hmm. them an email, my whole team, like, you cannot email me again, ever. No emails, except mm -hmm. for when it is a binary email. And you send me a message like, hey, Tom, we've got this problem. I did some research. I think these are three possible solutions. My advice is to go for solution uh, B because X, Y, Z. And then the interesting question comes at the end, is that okay, question mark. And now I could hit all R for reply, type in Y, E, S, control enter to send it off instead of typing all this text. I was so dumb at the time I didn't realize that instead of just optimizing my typing flow, yeah. I was actually training my team to become much more problem-solving problem oriented, much more proactive, uh, grow in their own responsibility, their own authority, their own professionalism. I changed my entire team by this simple introduction of binary emails. And of course, at the, at the time we were using email a lot now you have slack and whatsapp and what have you like so it, it, but the principle is the same we just call them binary messages now or i also use the same principle in binary me so when i have a meeting with one of my team members they are not allowed to bring up any problem i always want the proposal so i can say yes or no so just to be clear for our, our audience 
binary messages are for a forcing function for the person who's communicating with you to phrase things where you can answer yes or no yes, versus exactly. a full book <laughs> that you'd have to type to explain. And if they needed more context or needed conversation, what would they do? So would they this, reach out to you to have like a, a, a year in-depth or maybe meeting? two years later? I was I was tired of answering yes no emails, and I told them I don't want any more emails from you, not even binary emails. If you have anything that's practical, logistical, project management kind of stuff, you can come to my office on Monday morning. You ask Eve, my operation manager, what's your time slot? We didn't have Calendly at the time and no Zoom meetings either. And uh, you get 20 minutes. I take a kitchen timer, a literal device kitchen timer. I set it to 20 minutes, put it on the table between us. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> so, and you have 20 minutes to ask me any question, to give me any binary proposal that you have. Maybe if I was away for a couple of weeks, you could get a small extension. Maybe mm -hmm. after your 20 minutes, I had some stuff to discuss with you as well. Like, like we could be a little flexible, but not too much. So every once in a while, one of these people walked into my office with a single espresso. So that meant <laughs> that they really needed something from me. And that for me, that meant that on Monday at lunchtime, I had all the logistical, practical, administrative stuff was taken care of. So it was a forcing function for me to figure out ways to make my team responsible instead of taking all the responsibility on me all the time. You know, that is so insightful, Tom, because what I've learned in researching, because I'm a psychologist by education and uh, a deep researcher on leadership, that humans adapt pretty quickly. And if you give them the parameters in which to adapt, they will find a way to make it work um, yep. for them as well. And while some may think, oh, Tom's being a little harsh, you know, of what he's mandating. If he, if you, I'm sure you explain to your team, you know, why you're doing this and how this is going to help us and let's try it first, you know. Those are I'm great I'm sure they found a way to work within that, right? Yeah, they, I mean, I Without love, being mad at you anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, those are great suggestions, Karen. And that shows that you studied psychology where I have not, because I realized in hindsight, and I'm now telling my clients, you might want to introduce it as an experiment. with like ah, a set deadline and, and we will evaluate it. I mean, that makes total sense. So I've been trained in diplomacy for six months, and that will always be a learned skill for me. I love working with my team. I really respect these people. I am just not so diplomatic in my approach. And that's one of my pitfalls. So no, I did not explain all of this to them. I just told them, we're, this is how we're going to do it. This from is now how we're going to do it. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry <laughs> to say, but that's how, but, but it worked. But they uh -huh. were kind of kicking and screaming in the beginning, because as sure. you say, you change the parameters, you change the context, and then you have to adapt. But I am a firm believer in changing the boundaries, changing the context, instead of applying willpower all the time and discipline. That's, that's tiring. Yeah, it is. You're definitely right. So because you have worked with so many leaders, Tom, what are some of the top things that you see entrepreneurial leaders struggle with? Oh, there are so many. And part of that is because leadership is so complicated. So maybe it starts there okay. where I've worked with a ton of leaders from Europe, but also from the US. And every time I ask people like, when you started to lead a professional team, did you get, how did you prepare yourself? What kind of training did you get? What kind of coaching did you get? And like I did the research in 94% for 94% of the professional leaders in my home country, they had never had any serious leadership training when they started to lead. I'm not just talking entrepreneurs, I'm also talking managers and directors and like in huge corporations. We just start, like people throw us into the deep 
or we do it ourselves. We throw ourselves in the deep end, which works great if you're a 10 quick start like me, but you make all the mistakes. Really learn from like a huge experience that the world has in, in leading people. So the problem then becomes you read a book about one aspect of leadership and you start to think like, oh, this is true. This feels so good. We need to do this while ignoring the rest of it. Everything else. Right. Yes, you're so right. So I feel that we are struggling with so many things that should be relatively easy. Like Mm -hmm. we're struggling with motivating our employees. It's so easy. We're struggling with hiring the right people for their job. It's right. pretty easy. We start. We struggle with finding people that enjoy doing the work that we ourselves hate doing. It's relatively easy. And we struggle with communication. We struggle with boundaries. We struggle with the level of quality that our team provides. And all these issues can be fixed, but we have to take the, the work of a leader seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look at... Uh, multiple aspects at the same time. I don't think you can concentrate on one sliver of leadership and hope to have the type of impact on you and your team that you, you know, really want, you know, but that's just me anyway. (laughs) No, no, no. I think you're totally right because it is about the entire existence of being humans together. And like, if you have no strategy, you cannot be a great leader, right? on the level where your responsibility is. But if you have no diplomacy, it's going to be hard as well. That's why I had to learn it. But if you have no idea on how to evaluate team members as well, if you are working all the time, like all these things, it's like a holistic puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle. And if one piece is not there, that's not the, may not be a huge problem. But if you're starting to, miss 10 or 50 or 100 now we're in trouble we're big trouble yes (laughs) and really quick where do you you know i find that a lot of leaders struggle with finding great talent right and building their teams and what have you and i know you have a, a interesting perspective on that so can you share a little bit about how you advise your clients to Find and retain um, great talent and also have the courage to delegate to them as well. There are 15 questions in one. So let (laughs) me see how far I come. (laughs) So I feel that it's a marketing challenge, basically. So the first thing that, that the entrepreneur that we work with, there's a couple of things we do with them, like figure out who are you? Because every individual is unique, right? Every entrepreneur is unique. I cannot give you any advice until I get to know you. Then we need to figure out what's the current root cause of most of the problems in your business. So we create a list of all the problems, then we map them out in a scheme, and we try to figure out to pinpoint the bottlenecks or the root causes. And then we focus our attention on solving those issues instead of trying to solve a thousand problems at the same time. Mm. Oftentimes, it turns out that your team is one of the underlying problems or the bottom. It always is. It always does on the list. (laughs) So (laughs) so the next step would probably be to create an or a dream org chart, which is my term for an organizational chart two years into the future. So we disconnect it into our minds from the current situation. We don't take into account anybody who's working for us right now. If we can dream up the ideal organizational chart in uh, two years into the future or five years if you're slow, then we can map out what kind of roles do we have, which departments do we have, which roles do we have in each department. And then you can figure out what kind of people do I need there. So let's say you have one of your departments is marketing, sales, and PR. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, right? For most businesses. And then you probably need somebody in your team there who is a superstar sales person. And now that we know the role and we need, you may also make a different decision and say, instead of one superstar, I'd rather have three like good sales persons, fine with me, might be right. more, <laughs> more intelligent depending on your situation. But now you have defined the role and you create a scorecard for the role. I'm looking for this kind of person what we now know 
is we know about us, the, we know about the company, we know about the mission of the company, we know about the role, we know about the kind of person that we're looking for. So that's, we write it up, we say, hey, we are Acme company, we are great at this and that and that, and we are looking for a superstar salesperson, and we need this and that and that from you, and these many hours a week, and you need to have these qualifications, and in return, we will pay you base salary and these bonuses. Apply here. Nobody cares. You're right. <laughs> Who cares? No one. <laughs> we are looking for a superstar salesperson. That's right. Or we are looking for somebody who's really great at running an office or somebody who is fantastic at tech support. Who cares? These people, if they are really good at what they're doing, they already have a job. They have a great salary. They, they have respect in their profession and in their the business where they're working or the organization where they're working. They are not looking for a job because they are really great. And two or three percent of them may be looking for a job for what kind of reason? But like, there's ninety seven percent of them uh, that are you're not and going to get looking. their attention. So, my suggestion would be to now turn it inside out, upside down. And start thinking about them. Who is your ideal candidate? What kind of a person is that? And how could you kind of grab their attention? How could you motivate their desire to change jobs? Which is a pretty big deal, right? For most people. It is so, huge. so you need to have a pretty huge desire to change jobs or even consider that. How can right. you earn their trust? How can you help them be motivated to even check out the job, the offering that you have? And so now we're in the realm of marketing, where instead of trying to help your new clients that you can really help and make really happy, how you can convince them to check out what you're offering them, now you're look, doing marketing for new hires. I love and that. so I have a client... And from Belgium, she was running a software company. She she grew 5,000% in three years. That's like times 50. She was looking for a specific kind of software developers, compiler programmers. These people, all, want, all of them want to work for Apple and for Google because they are names. like hugely, <laughs> insanely intelligent nerds. Right. that are very, very specialized. And she needed them for her company. She told me, Tom, I, I don't know where to find these people. So we helped her to turn this inside out, upside down, start thinking uh, through the eyes or the experience of the compiler programmer. And three months later, she solved her problem. She had her compiler programmer. And a year later, she told me, Tom, I have so many job applicants. I don't know what to do with them. And nothing changed about the company. Nothing changed about the job. It was just putting yourself into the shoes of your new, new hire. How can you improve her? But how did she reach out to them? Where did she go? Did she go to like meetups? Or, I mean, how did she even reach them if they weren't in the job market? I think for a lot of compiler programmers, or you start looking, where is their attention already? Right. So there is another company and they build hardware for building hardware basically like so they have these hugely complex machines that factories use to create like your intel chips for instance and this company was looking for a specific type of person and there's only two universities in the world where they train these people so one of them was close by no problem everybody knew this company asml the other one was, I guess, in Korea. Nobody there who studied this uh, on this faculty had heard about this company, but they wanted to hire these people. So the first question is, where is the attention of these people? Right. So they started to put up ads in the subway that, ah. went, that went back and so forth between the, the city and the university campus. So, so you go where they are. Exactly, because that's where their attention is. Gotcha. But you, you come up with entirely different solutions because these people are not looking for a job, so you need to catch their attention. 
You know, that brings up a great point about what we had discussed um, earlier in our pre-interview. Uh, you had shared with, um, I, as my listeners know, I always ask the guests, you know, which of the, you know, seven behaviors or tactics uh, that I read in my book really resonated with you. And you mentioned strategic decision making. And based on our conversation thus far, I can see why, because it seems like making the good and right decisions will make or break you as a leader and can make or break your business. But I don't want to put words in your mouth because, you know, I'm chatty. No, no, but but tell me why it resonated with you, strategic decision making. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I feel that as a lead, I think the definition of leader is you help people to work together. And one of the things you need to do is to be able to make decisions on different levels of uh, impact right exactly. so if we are setting up a booth uh, somewhere because we go to a conference and we want to to help people find our offering then we need to figure out that the booth looks great right that's a are we going to go for a wide a wide tablecloth or are we going to bring a blue or a pink or a red one that's a decision on the other end of the spectrum you have the strategic decisions and I feel that many entrepreneurs abdicate their responsibility for making these strategic decisions. They just don't consciously make them. They happen because they don't have the time, which is one of my favorite subjects, how to free up time for thinking. They don't have the time to properly do the thinking. And also, they may not have the skills or the training really think through these strategic issues. No, I think you're spot on. You're spot on, Tom. And so in your practice, will you share with the audience a little bit about, because I want folks to know exactly kind of what you do to kind of to help your clients so that they know, you know, to reach out to you if they're facing similar challenges. So uh, where does your practice focus on? What do you do for your clients? Yeah, we currently have a program, it's called a refactor. In, in the world of software, there is the concept of refactoring where you don't throw away the old software and you start building everything anew. But instead of doing that, you take the old software, you try to pinpoint where are the biggest problems located, where are the real serious bugs. Let's optimize that part. We will refactor this part of the software. And my thinking is, why don't we do that with businesses as well? Because Great point. for you and for me, anytime anybody runs a business, you can see a thousand problems, right? Everything can always be improved or optimized. But let's figure out like where is the where are the the bugs, and let's refactor that part of your business and do that with small experiments. So what we do is we, we help entrepreneurs with like maybe five to 50 people working for them because that's where they are very involved in the business themselves instead of being the CEO of like a much a bigger corporation. I enjoy working with people that are still in the thick of things. <laughs> and we help them figure out who they are. We help them figure out where the underlying root causes are. We have a whole system for doing that. It, that's pretty hard thinking work if you have to do it by yourself. It becomes really easy if we help you to do that. And then we create the solutions together for fixing the underlying problems. And because we have a whole toolbox of interventions and scenarios and mini experiments, we can speed up that process. So basically, we help entrepreneurs free up four to eight hours a week in within three months or maybe six months, depending on their situation. Wow. Amazing. Well, listeners, if you need that kind of support, which um, I think I might have Tom on speed dial after this, <laughs> uh, his, uh, he and his team can really help. But before I let you go, Tom, you've got to tell me why I need two cell phones. <laughs> why do entrepreneurs... Why do you suggest Every that they should have at least two or three mobile devices? Two cell, cell phones. <laughs> so let me show this to you. This is my Please. cell phone. Uh -huh. And I've used this for many, many years. And I love cell phones and I love um, a texting and WhatsApp and what have you. Like I enjoy social media as well. But then I'm pretty creative. So when I want to unplug from my business, 
I want to spend time with my wife, my children, my family, my friends. I want to go skiing or whatever. I Basically, I really want to relax and recharge. Sure. And it's Monday or it's Saturday morning and you look at your phone because you want to check the weather and you see a preview of a WhatsApp message from one of your clients about a problem. And suddenly your weekend is ruined, right? Because Yeah, because you're diving deep into that. Yeah. <laughs> my brain is not letting go of that problem because it's constantly problem solving. So th this is what I did. It was a tip from Elko de Boer. He said you need to buy another phone. That's what I did. This is my okay. family phone. Everybody had the number of the old phone. I shared the number of the new phone just with family and friends and with one person in my, on my team. So I come home. This one goes into the safe. Some of my clients that I tell them to, to buy a business phone, they hand it into their spouse or their partner to lock it away for them for the weekend. Uh -huh. I don't need that. I just switch it off, I put it away. Uh -huh. And then in the weekend or at night, I only use my family phone. Ah, super smart. Talk about creating boundaries. That is... Exactly. That's like changing the boundaries for yourself. Yeah. There was one problem with this phone though, Karen. What's it that? has TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, <laughs> Twitter. So Everything. It, you know, it kept grabbing my attention, yeah. which is why I bought another one, an old iPhone SE. And you didn't this one the is really on there. slow. This can do pretty much nothing, but it, I can take notes. I can read a book if I'm patient enough. I can use Google Maps. I can use Spotify. This one is in my pocket all the time. Interesting. This one that is trying to suck me into the deep hole of TikTok, which I enjoy doing every once in a while. I feel sure. that it gives me value. This right. one is in my backpack. I need to actually reach for it. Um, it. And it's not there when I'm standing in line in the supermarket and I feel bored because I need to wait 20 seconds, right? Then right. I, I don't grab this all the time, 50 times per day. And the business phone is off right now because we're in this conversation. And I find that this really helps me to avoid staying alive by willpower and uh, <laughs> energy uh, alone. Okay, Tom, you are my hero. So I am going to try, I won't say I'm going to get three phones, but I'm going to try that second phone idea because I fine. am locked great. into my phone 24-7. So <laughs> that is a great suggestion. I feel so frustrated. I've had this discussion with clients of mine. I've been telling them for half a year, like many in different conversations, like explaining to them, you cannot live with just one phone. You need them other yeah, one fun. and they keep postponing that and struggling against it and giving me arguments why they won't and then half a year later they try it out and it takes them a month or so to get used to it just, they tell yeah. me, this is the greatest thing ever tom yes of course imagine. that's why i told you <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is fantastic advice. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for um, coming to the podcast. We have quite a few notes. I've been taking notes while we've been talking. Cool. Uh, some great, interesting ideas uh, for our, our audience members to start with. But there is a ton more information, especially on your blog, on your site. So we're going to have direct our listeners to our show notes so that they can go and take a look at all the services and all the bits of advice that uh, thank you. you have shared. But thank you so much for the gift of your time. Thanks for having me, Karen. I really enjoyed our conversation and the, my accent and your thought and draw together <laughs> make a good... It worked perfectly together, right? I hope together, it works right? for the listeners to listen to both of us and I hope that they really get some value out of this. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they did. <laughs> Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. You too. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Tom Sharp, founder and CEO of Build Cool Things. Links to his bio, his entry into our leadership playbook, and additional resources can be found in the show notes, both on your favorite podcast platform of choice and on the web at leadyourgamepodcast.com. And now, for Karen's take on today's topic of entrepreneurial leadership. 
Now, admittedly, I have spent most of my career teaching leadership in the corporate world. But when I founded my own firm in 2013, I learned quickly how nuanced and different the world of entrepreneurial leadership truly is. There is an art to launching a new venture, inspiring others to come along with you on the journey, and being at the helm of running all aspects of business operations. So today, I just want to share a few characteristics that are common amongst top performing entrepreneurial leaders. So get out your pencil. The first one is being able to adapt quickly to dynamic circumstances. Now, this can be a valuable asset in industries that change often or during times of general organization, social or cultural change. The second characteristic is generating positive change. Those leaders and individuals who have the ability to motivate and inspire positive sweeping changes can help your company accelerate its progress and growth. The third characteristic is being constantly innovative. The ability to think creatively and develop innovative solutions to challenges can help your company stay extremely competitive. The fourth characteristic is succeeding in uncertain environments. Those leaders who have the strength to deal with ambiguity and are really good at handling risk management can provide a strong foundation for resilience in your organization. And the fifth and final characteristic is setting ambitious goals. By maintaining high standards for yourself, your employees, and your company, that will definitely help you to overachieve on your goals and objectives. So thanks again for listening to our podcast. You know, I only ask one thing of all of you that's to subscribe to the podcast, review it, and just share it with just one friend. Thanks so much for listening and see you next week. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast where we help you leave your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. You can check out the show notes, additional episodes, bonus resources, and also submit guest recommendations on our website at leadyourgamepodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn by searching for the name Karen Rhodes with Karen being spelled K-A-R-A-N. And if you like the show, the greatest gift you can give would be to subscribe and leave a rating on your podcast platform of choice. This podcast has been a production of Shockingly Different Leadership, a global consultancy which helps organizations execute their people, talent development, and organizational effectiveness initiatives on an on-demand project or contract basis. Huge thanks to our production and editing team for a job well done. Goodbye for now.